Good afternoon. Welcome to the University at Buffalo here at the MNT Auditorium at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Science. And for those of you, of course, who are on Zoom and for those of you who may watch this later, my name is Steve Schweisberg. I have the honor of being the chairman of the Department of Surgery, and we are hosting this second annual endowed lectureship on social justice and health equity. Many thanks right off the bat to the students of the SNMA who are manning the tables, checking vaccination records. Special thanks to Christine Fontaneda, Jen Britton from the Advancement Office who have helped us with so many of the details and this lovely stage that we've got set up. But for the students that are here, this is not what you experience every day. And of course, uh, absolute special shout out to Mike Lamb, who's our Director of Surgical Education, who's worked on an infinite number of details bringing our programs together. And who saves me as recently as three minutes ago from making a terrible faux pas about our Dean. This lectureship was initiated by the surgeons of the faculty practice of UVMD surgery. And I hope indicates how seriously we take these issues. As a department of surgery, we have come together in order to educate ourselves, our trainees, our colleagues, and our community about the injustices of racism and the pressing need to create a more equitable world. Our department does have ongoing activities at the neighborhood level and, and even prior to the murder of George Floyd, inspiring school-aged children <clears throat> towards STEM activities and building a stronger pipeline in the future world. Last summer, we welcomed our first cohort of Department of Surgery Health Equity Summer Research Scholars, three students, Abena, Mario, and Nigel, who went out into the community to learn about the barriers of care that clearly we don't understand well enough. This spring, we will be able to return and have our drone STEM event exciting multi-high school competition, inspiring high school kids towards STEM education, and once again will be hosted by clinical volunteer faculty, James Butch Rosser, professor of surgery, recently seen on the Today Show, discussing the tribulations of morbid obesity in his own personal journey and his wives. We as surgeons, are what we do. But again, that's true for everybody. And what we are doing today is engaging in hard conversations, confronting realities rather than quietly passing by the facades that others would like us to believe. One of these facades is that healthcare is delivered equitably to all. Today, it's simply not true. But we will move in the right direction if we start by confronting reality. Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens, our key keynote speaker, is a relentless historian who is uncovering many of these truths. Her book, Medical Bondage, has been read by many in our department and was the topic of our fall book club and was incredibly illuminating how far back the threads of systemic racism really reach, but I'm not going to steal her thunder. I would like to acknowledge the students who are here, the faculty, the guests, our friends. A couple of special shout outs to um, Eunice Lewin, who is a State University of New York trustee. Thank you for coming. Very much appreciated. <laughs> Thomas, are, are you here? Is I'd like to also acknowledge Thomas Buford is the president and chief executive officer of the Buffalo Urban League. Our journey in the Department of Surgery has been helped by so many people in the community, Pastors Pointer and Nicholas, Raul Vasquez and his team, and so many, many others that we have been thrilled to meet over the last year and months, last night, and I'm very, very grateful. So, enough of that. 
It is also my extreme pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Allison Brashear, who joined the University at Buffalo in December 2021 as Vice President and Dean of the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Brashear is a neurologist by training and came to us from her previous post from UC Davis. She has an extraordinarily distinguished career of academic and clinical accomplishment and we are lucky to have her here in Buffalo. Please let's give her a rousing welcome to the podium. Thank you so much, Dr. Schweisberg. Um, alumni, faculty, trainees, community members, and guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. A special thank you to Dr. Schwartzberg and the Department of Surgery for launching an anti-racism and healthcare equity initiative last year and for continuing to advance the discussions about the impact of race in medicine. Everyone, especially us in healthcare professions, must be committed to sustained action towards a more diverse and equitable community. Leaders nationwide are recognizing that medical racism is a public health crisis. The recognition is an important step, but it is only the first step in advancing racial equity. We must expand access to healthcare and change the medical education and the training system to teach anti-racism medical practices. At the Jacobs School, we are committed to improving health by training the next generation of providers. While we have a way to go, we are focused on the diversity of our medical school student body, our faculty, as well as the diversity of those who train in our residency programs. We are committed to expanding our pathway programs to provide opportunities for students of color to enter medicine and we're committed to correcting the ways of the past and changing the way that we teach and care for patients. As the Vice President for Health Sciences and Dean of the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, I am committed to having our school be a leader in directly addressing structural racism in medicine and how we teach, direct research, and care for patients. The discussions like we're having tonight are critical to achieving the goals of abolishing structural racism. Dr. Michael Lamb, thank you for organizing this event. And Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor and Thomas Ward, we appreciate and value your participation. And I wanna welcome our speakers, India Walton and Dr. Dreja Cooper Owens. Dr. Owens is an acclaimed expert on US medical history whose work has been paramount in illuminating a number of issues that concern African-American experiences, oppression, and reproductive justice. Dr. Cooper Owens, thank you for being here to deliver the keynote address. It is an absolute honor to gain your insights. To our panelists, Rita Hubbard Robinson, Dr. Vanessa Barnaby, Dr. Beth Harvey, and, my, and our medical student, Maya Abadevi. Um, a wholehearted thank you to each of you for speaking and giving us an opportunity to broaden our viewpoints and learn from you. So with that, let's embark on a meaningful conversation and thank you so much. Henry Taylor is Professor of Urban and Regional Planning in the School of Architecture at the University of Buffalo. He has been a tireless advocate for the Black community in Buffalo for many, many years. His most recent report, The Harder We Run, The State of Black Buffalo in 1990 and the Present, informs all of us that we have not made as much progress as we need or, have a, or what we should expect. This is another uncomfortable truth. I have learned so much from Henry over the last two years. He joined our efforts uh, as we organized after the death of George Floyd, and it is an honor to welcome him to the podium. Henry.
I have the uh, privilege of introducing India Walton. As a scholar, I'm intrigued by the interplay between the who-ness and the whatness of a person. Understanding India Walton requires the blending of these two identifiers. Through the eyes of a casual observer, India's early life seems less than uh, pedestrian. Her family lived on the economic edge. She became a mother at age 14. She dropped out of high school. She was a welfare recipient. She experienced rape and domestic abuse. India knew pain and hardship by its first name. But India Walton survived all of this. Undefeated and undaunted, Walton get, got her GED, went to nursing school, found work as a registered nurse, and eventually became a union representative. India was not done. She became a community activist and founding executive director of the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust. Today, she is the senior advisor for special projects within the New York Working Families Party. However, it was her experience as a public school nurse that transformed India. In this setting, Walton saw the harmful connections and intersections between the health challenges of children, poverty, low incomes, and life on the economic edge. This is where the whatness of India Walton enters the story. The hardship, suffering, and pain India experienced and witnessed down on the ground in Buffalo's forgotten east side taught her about the socioeconomic challenge, political challenges facing black people, people of color, and working class folks. This astute working class intellectually brilliantly translated the people's socioeconomic art, art obstacles and miseries into theories and concepts that explain their plight and, and pointed us in the direction of remedies to solve their problems. India Walton did not just run for mayor of the city of Buffalo. India provided the people with an alternative vision of our city and made them believe that another, better, more democratic, and just Buffalo was possible. Most significantly, she reminded us that the greatest challenge we face is the willingness to face the greatest challenge that we face. What drew Beyond the Knife and myself to India Walton was her focus on health care as the anchor of city building and neighborhood development. She not only understood the role of structural racism and the social determinants of health in producing race-based health inequalities, but she also forged a series of bold ideas on how to abolish them. We are blessed to have her as one of our own. And with the greatest of pleasure, I present to you Miss India Walton. Can somebody provide me with a recording of that so I can listen to it each and every morning, especially on those tough days when I need extra motivation? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzer, uh, Schweitzberger and the Department of Surgery, the UB Community Health Equity Research Institute and all the community partners for organizing what is sure to be a thought-provoking and powerful discourse this evening. My name is India Walton. 
I am a mother of four. I've given birth three times. I'll let you do the math. The first time I was only 14 years old. By the time I was 19, I was pregnant again, this time with twins. At 24 weeks, I went into preterm labor. And despite having told the attending physician multiple times that I felt pressure and I felt like I needed to push, even though I was only 19, I knew my body, I was ignored until my labor progressed to the point that I required an emergency cesarean. My babies were admitted to the NICU where I often felt like more of a nuisance than a mother. Being told that the care that they received was very expensive, that I was young and I could have more children, or when I called to get updates, simply being told they're stable with no explanation. When I complained to one of my favorite nurses, she said, we'll go to nursing school. After six months, I took my twins home, one on oxygen, the other with an ileostomy and a broviac. I would regularly take them to follow-up appointments on public transportation with oxygen tanks and monitors in tow. It wasn't long before I took Kathy's advice and went to nursing school. Eventually, I returned to the same NICU my boys were in. Being a former NICU parent definitely gave me a different perspective. We were sending our most vulnerable patients home unprepared. They were not set up for success. I also discovered that my negative experiences with healthcare were not the result of individual biases, but rather systems that have been built to exclude certain people from certain communities and certain social statuses. Systems of long-standing and deep-seated beliefs and misbeliefs about certain groups of people. Dr. Cooper Owens' exploration into the exploitation of black and immigrant bodies and the foundations of modern gynecology gives us permission to take a deep dive into what we believe to be true versus what the experience is of the person on the other side of your stethoscope or your scalpel is experiencing. I wanna thank everyone for being here and I wanted to encourage us all to create a safe space for curiosity, for honesty, and for vulnerability. Most importantly, I hope we leave here a little more compassionate, a little more empathetic, and a bit more bold to stand in the gap for so many who don't feel empowered to self-advocate. Thank you. Thank you. If I ever want to convince anybody of anything, I'm calling Henry to speak. And India, thank you so much for your comments. <sighs> Professor Tom Ward is an award-winning historian and assistant dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at SUNY Farmingdale. He is a noted authority on issues of race and healthcare in the American South, and is the author of several books with numerous articles and reviews, and his work has been featured in media outlets, including the New York Times and the Atlantic. Tom joined our team after contacting us following our inaugural, the inaugural lecture last year hosting Cornell West. He brings a nuanced historical perspective to our group and ultimately led us to Dr. Cooper Owens. He is also in his past life was a beer critic. So I'm going to welcome him to some Buffalo beer as, as all as we are so proud of what we bring to the table. I would like to welcome Dr. Tom Ward to the table. Thank you, Steve. That, it's, uh, it's nice to be here. It's been, it's been great to be part of this group. Uh, I'm extremely pleased tonight to introduce this year's Beyond the Knife speaker, Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens. Dr. Cooper Owens is the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor of History and Medicine at the, and the Director of Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, she is also the Director of the Program in African American History at the Library, of, uh, Library Company of Philadelphia, the co country's oldest cultural institution. 
She is an uh, Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecturer, a past American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologist Research Fellow, and has won a number of prestigious honors and awards for her scholarly and advocacy in reproductive and birthing issues. Most recently, the University of Virginia Center for Nursing Historical Inquiry selected Dr. Cooper Owens as the 2022 Agnes Dillon Randolph Award winner for her historical work. Her first book, Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology, which uh, they will be selling and she'll be signing afterwards tonight. I'll give you, give you a plug so everyone gets there. Uh, won the Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Hor Historians as the best book written in African-American women's and gender history. Her next book, Reshaping Freedom, How Harriet Tubman's uh, Disability Transformed the Nation, will be the first Tubman, Tubman biography that examines the freedom fighter's life and political work as a disabled person. I have been fortunate enough to hear Dr. Cooper Owens speak on a couple of uh, previous occasions. Uh, the first time about four years ago, not, not long after medical bondage came out when I was on the board of the uh, Mobile Medical uh, Museum, and we had her come speak at the University, uh, University of South Alabama's uh, medical school. Um, it, it was uh, a, a, for our annual speech, and we had a crowd like this. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, and what impresses me most about Dr. Cooper Owens' work is that she does what every good historian should do. She takes the story that people think they know, takes the conventional narrative, and, they, and she turns it on its head. She enlightens the readers to the wider history, to the parts that have been overlooked or forgotten. I don't want to go into what you're going to talk about tonight, but in Medical Bondage, the story of Dr. Marion Sims, the father of modern gynecology, a story that medical historians knew. She changes it. She gets us to look at this story in a totally different way. And she puts these uh, enslaved women, she puts these immigrant women, she puts them at the center of the story. She puts them at the center of their own history. She empowers uh, these people. And in totally, I, I know when I first read the book and when I first heard you, it's a story I knew. Uh, I'm a medical historian. And I said, I hadn't thought about it this way. And it was, it, you know, that, that's, 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 what, that's what good history should do. It should get you to say, wow, that's not the part of the story I had thought about before. And, and, it, it, and it's a, you know, she has really given us a gift. Um, I don't want to get into, I don't want to get into what you're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to stop and just say that you're all in for a great treat tonight. And please join me in welcoming this year's Beyond the Knife speaker, Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens. Thank you all so, so, so much. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to be here. I didn't bring notes, so I know I will forget names. So I am going to say thank you to every person who came before me who gave comments. But I do want to give a special thanks to Michael Lamb, who has just been really great um, and so helpful. And also, who knew that uh, Steve would serve as, you know, as this like uh, intellectual giant in this community, and then also a chauffeur for me last night at Hutchins. So thank you very much <laughs> for that. Um, I want to dedicate this this talk because it is Black History Month. Um, I want to dedicate this talk to the descendants of the mothers of gynecology that I'll speak about tonight. So India Walton is a flesh and blood representation of that, but also my late maternal grandmother, so I'm gonna speak her name, Mary Jane Elizabeth, because she would get me if I didn't say that. Mary Jane Elizabeth McFadden Cooper, who died five weeks before her 100th birthday, but she created and carved a life for her children and her children's children um, that I am so very, very fortunate to have uh, benefited from. And she was uh, LPN born in 1917, and that was probably the one of the greatest achievements of her life. So with that said, I'm, I'm going to start. Let's see here. So I have to cheat. The screen is behind me, so I have to look at the PowerPoint on my phone in front of me <laughs> to know what you all are looking at. So what history reveals in our understanding of U.S. medicine? And uh, Tom gave a pretty good, a pretty good description of what I do. 
right? When you win an award, people tell you all kinds of things. Oh my God, she's brilliant. And I'm like, actually, I'm not going to, I'm not going to contest that. However, what I'm going to say is, what I'm going to say is, I, I literally just looked at the sources from the perspective of the patients. That was it. How would a source look if I didn't center the doctor, but I actually centered the patient? What findings would we get? And so that really led me onto this path. Right? So next slide. Now, when I used to give these talks, I'm so used to standing around and gesticulating, I should have gotten mic'd up. I told Steve, oh, no, no, I'm going to stay at the podium. So I use my, my hands a lot. Um, when I first started this about four years or so ago, when my book came out, you know, I would always have some well-meaning person come up to me. They would never state it, as, you know, loudly in front of folk, but they would come up to, to the podium after the talk. Oh, it was so great. I learned a lot. It was atrocious what they did to the slaves. But, uh, you know, I have five children in me, and they just don't listen to women. I said, really? And unfortunately, these were always white women who would come up to me, and I said, really? I'm telling you, they just don't listen to women. And I said, well, when you can prove statistically that white women are suffering from infant mortality, morbidity, maternal mortality, and morbidity, then I'll change my talk. And so I started to say that loudly because I got, you know, I, I didn't want to be mean because these people were paying me good money. So I needed to, you know, I needed to maintain some civility. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to fix that. Why don't I stick this slide and then the next one in, and I haven't gotten any more of those comments, right? So I write about dead people. I'm not a doctor like you all are, or a nurse. I, people sometimes tell me their health concerns. I'm like, no, I write about dead doctors. I, I have a PhD, not an MD, right? So I write about doctors who lived in the late 18th century and the 19th century, but primarily the 19th century. So this guy to my right is Samuel Cartwright. And many of you, especially those who are interested in medical history, you know about Sam Cartwright. He rose to fame, some might say infamy, during the 1830s with the publication of an article that was about Negro distinctive diseases. Now, lest we think Cartwright was just twiddling his thumbs thinking about this, he was just actually asked by the Louisiana State Medical Association to conduct research and to publish his findings on these possible distinctive diseases of the Negro. And so Cartwright gets the work. I mean, he was highly educated. And so he conducts his research on an enslaved population. And in fact, he finds that the Negro does have distinctive medical conditions and diseases as compared to white people. And so he found that Negroes have a propensity to eat dirt. He called them the dirt eaters. He found that Negroes suffered from rascality, so when they talked back and act, you know, acted sassy. He also found that there was a Negro mental illness called drapetomania, which meant that if an enslaved person ran away or harbored the thought of running away, I mean, you could just think it, and he said you were a lunatic. It was a mental illness. So that's kind of how people discuss Samuel Cartwright. I become interested in Sam Cartwright, not because of that publication, because he got some pushback even in the antebellum era from other physicians, where they were like, come on, man. Come on, Sam, really? Right? But why I'm really interested in Cartwright is the work he did with the spirometer and race-based studies. So if you look at this book, and this is a plug for a, a colleague whose, whose work and scholarship I admire, Lundy Brown uh, just retired from Brown University. She's a medical anthropologist. But she wrote a book a few years ago, Breathing into the Machine, and it was about the spirometer, that machine that assesses lung capacity. So in the 1850s, Cartwright once again studies enslaved Black people and white people. He wants to measure lung capacity. And so his findings determine that, in fact, the Negro has a lessened or diminished lung capacity. The study is so important that by the start of the Civil War, on the North side, not the Confederate States of America, the United States of America, the US Sanitary Commission uses this race-based study with a number of tools like the spirometer to determine, in fact, if the Negro and the white man 
are similar or dissimilar. Right? And so one may think, okay, so that was then, what's the legacy now? So I have to always say, Sam Cartwright wasn't necessarily exceptional. Thomas Jefferson had written about this in 1803 in his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia, where he talked about the lessened uh, lung capacity of black people. In 1799, Benjamin Rush, known as the father of American medicine or either the father of American psychiatry, he writes in an article, actually a kind of a pro-abolitionist article for 1799, that in fact the Negro has lessened lung capacity. So there were already these ideas that were circulating. So by the time we get to the 21st century, right? So this was me being a rascal. I guess I had a little bit of rascality, right? So to kind of get to those, those, those women who would sneak and, and tell me about, you know, their experiences, even though they were sitting here healthy with all of their children in tow. But I said, well, let me, let me put in the medical racism piece now, because I didn't do the research. And I always tell folks, most of the researchers don't look like me. I'm just using what they produce, right? Because sometimes you get charges of not being objective. So I'm like, I didn't do it. I'm just reporting, right? So Kelly Hoffman, at the time, was a doctoral candidate in psychology at the University of Virginia. Now I can tell you, I was a postdoc at the University of Virginia. And the University of Virginia, no offense to anybody who's graduated from there, served as postdoc, but they're mighty proud of themselves. I mean, you know, they would come to me, oh my God, aren't you happy you're here? And I was like, you know, I did graduate from UCLA. I mean, it wasn't like Fox Swamp, you know, Institute. So it was this sense that you are here in Mr. Jefferson's university. It is really elite and it's really hard to get into. And it is, it is. So she and her research team in 2014 decide to, to do a sample study of 263 residents and medical faculty at UVA's medical school, one of the country's top medical school programs, right? And what she finds in this study is really incredible, even for me. And I'm, I'm rarely shocked by what I read about race and racism in this country, but it was shocking. Most of those residents believe that there were biological distinctions between black and white people. This was conducted in 2014, published in 2016. You can Google it, I promise you. They believe that black people aged faster, had thicker skin, experienced less pain or no pain at all for conditions like kidney stones and childbirth. Two of them even thought that black people were born with tails. And as I tell folks, I say, you have to think about this. These are not people who are coming from you know, high school these are people who have four-year degrees. They graduated from a university. And I can tell you, I mean, I look my age, but I'm, I'm almost 50 in a couple of months. And I've been doing this for quite some time. At least I know for the two decades I have been involved in formal higher education, we have always taught that race is a social construct. That human beings are 99.9% .9 more similar than they are different. So that means these people with four-year degrees who have gotten into one of the country's top medical schools are choosing to believe in anti-Blackness. That's a choice. And so when, you know, I always get these, well, what can we do? Stop teaching your kids to be anti-Black. I mean, these people out here believing that Black folk are born with a tail. I was just like, I mean, it's incredible. But lest we say Dr. Cooper almost has given us stats based on a less than 300 sample size. I got another big one for you at the end, I promise. I promise. I thought about all of that. So here we are, right? She publishes this and it makes a huge splash. And people are now starting to pay attention. Now I'm gonna put a pin in this and then tell you how I got, I got involved. Like most historians, you know, we think, I see Tom here and, and Jeanette Jones is a historian, Marina. We, we hope that maybe 10 people will buy our book, our family and our friends. <laughs> and then, you know, we'll have some job security. And uh, certainly that's what I thought. I, you know, I was like, well, if my family buys it. I have a large family on my father's side. Maybe, you know, they'll, they'll purchase 25 copies. But something happened, right? Something happened. In 2017, when I was still 
in uh, still working for CUNY. I was uh, assistant professor of African American history uh, at Queens College. That's where, in fact, Tom met me when I was giving that talk in Alabama. I was still at Queens. And in August, I remember getting a bunch of DMs. Like I said, I'm almost 50, been married a long time. My DMs are never popping, like the hip hop song said. So I'm like, who is this? Why are these pings and dings and, and that kind of thing? And people are like, why didn't you tell me about the protest? And I'm like, what protest? Well, some of you may have seen this, this photo that went viral of four black women donned in hospital gowns, splattered in red blood to represent paint, um, uh, red, excuse me, paint to represent blood. And they were trying to bring forth the, the message about the lives of the enslaved women stems experimented on. And so I'm getting these questions and these inquiries and I'm like, I don't know anything about it, right? But it was literally right in my backyard in, in Central Park. There's a huge, it was a statue uh, that had been erected early on to James Marion Sims that literally sat across the street from the New York, New York Academy of Medicine. And grassroots activists from that East Harlem area have been trying to get it removed for at least a decade. I had nothing to do with it. But what happened, folk found out that my book was coming out. My editor said at the time, we got to ride this political wave. And I was like, okay. And next thing you know, I was transformed from Deirdre Cooper Owens, assistant professor at Queens College in African American history to the country's foremost expert on James Marion Sims. And I was like, but wait, I write about the women, not Sims. But it was a moment for me. How do I play a little, you know, like be a little, a little, I don't know, shady? I didn't want to answer the journalist questions because that was my undergraduate degree in mass comm and, and journalism. So I didn't want to answer that question because I knew eventually the statue would either stay or be removed. What I wanted to be able to do was to educate folk about the 19th century. We are all really fortunate. Most Americans don't have college degrees. They don't have access to these spaces. Most folk are learning about the 19th century and slavery from movies, I mean, TV shows. So I never really played in light night. So when I got those questions, right, was he a, was the savior of women or a medical monster? I was like, well, eh, it's a little more complicated. Well, do you think the statue should go? You know, I'm going to let the, the community organizers who live in that area speak to that. But what I want to actually talk about is the legacy of medical racism and this maternal health crisis, because unfortunately, that didn't go away. So thankfully, on my birthday, April 17th, 2018, they removed the statue. Once again, I was like, the ghost of Sims continues to haunt me, <laughs> right? I thought people were calling to wish me happy birthday. They were calling to tell me, did you know the statue was being removed? And I'm like, mm, James Mary and Sims, right? But there's something about the way in which we framed this conversation. So either Sims is a monster or he's a savior. And I had to complicate it. And most of you can see I'm, I'm visibly black, right? For 49 years, I have been African-American. So I can't hide it, my voice, my nose, you know, my hair, all of those things. So I was like, gosh, if I, if I speak against, and not, not the sentiments, but I speak against some of the inaccuracies from the critics of Sims, and I'm a black woman, they're gonna say, oh my God, this woman is a sellout. She's trying to defend him. And then if I speak against those who really are, they want to defend him, oh my God, but he was so benevolent. He took them all in, he paid for their care. And so I said, you know what, just, just be the history professor in the, in the history of slavery and educate them. So let me tell you from the, from the pro side, Sims was loving, compassionate, and he cared because he sought out these cases. He promised the owners that he would take care of these women until they were cured and would do so at his own expense. Well, lots of physicians did that and medical schools in the South. It was normal. That's what you call leasing. The same way we lease cars, apartments, even our own labor, if we're working for a temp company. That's, that was so normal. He didn't create that. That was a practice that had been, geez, been in existence for centuries. So, of course, he's going to financially take care of this leased property. Notice I'm using air quotes. We know these are human beings, 
But legally, if you were enslaved, you were considered movable property or chattel, right? And so that's why he did it. It wasn't because of the benevolence that he had towards enslaved people. If that was the case, he wouldn't have been a slave owner. But even in the South, you couldn't, I mean, abolitionism was illegal. So even if he wanted to, he couldn't be an abolitionist in the South, which he didn't, trust me, <laughs> he didn't want to. And then on the, on the defense side, right? I mean, excuse me, on the, the critic side, here I was literally looking at people who look like me. And they're saying, but sis, come on now, you know he mutilated those women's bodies. You know he gave them opium and made them addicted to drugs. You know he should have asked for their consent so that he could perform these surgeries. You know he made them work. And you know, when the white medical uh, surgical assistants, they quit. And I'm saying, wait, let me, let me just paint the picture of the 19th century. Anesthesiology was founded, right? It was, it was developed in the 1840s. It was not commonly used. Anesthesiology as a branch of medicine had not been developed, it didn't exist. And any physician or surgeon worth his salt, notice I only use his, right, 19th century, worth his salt, is not going to intentionally give someone anesthesia and they don't know what the dosage should be. The person could bleed out. How do you know the patient is alive? In the 19th century, folk knew patients were alive because they screamed, they, they resisted, they squirmed. So Sims wasn't gonna use it. What about this informed consent that we know all too well? You, in fact, you all know it better than me, right? And then I have to say, well, if that was my argument, I wouldn't have a book. Remember, enslaved people by law were considered chattel. You don't go to an enslaved person and say, hey there, Betsy, I wanna take you from everything you know because you're sick. Why don't you come on with me so I can perform some experimental surgeries on you? If she said yes or no, it doesn't matter. She doesn't own herself. So he has to go to the owner. This is why informed consent in the 21st century, so it, I couldn't do it. The book wouldn't be published. What about, well, he gave them opiates and so did every doctor in the United States at that time and mercury and everything else that could kill you. That's why people didn't like going to the doctors because <laughs> you had a greater chance of dying back then. But guess what it also does? For practical purposes. He's suturing up the vaginal area, the upper vaginal area, because the bladder is exposed. Because these women of such official uh, patients are suffering from incontinence. Guess what that opiate does? Creates constipation. So it's not done because he's an evil monster, right? It's done for practical reasons. Well, you know what? He made them work and they were being operated on. And then I have to say to them, what do you think slavery was? People don't get sick days, vacation days. It didn't matter whether you were sick or healthy. You had to work. It was an economic labor system, period. So those are the, the kinds of things that I would, I would tell folks. And bless their hearts, the young Black undergrad students, when I would give these talks, they would be like, <clears throat> and you know, and I'm just like, I want to say, sister, just read the book. I promise you I'm not defending Sims. Like, I promise you. But we, that's the thing. We can be critical of historical figures, but let's do so with accurate information. Because trust me, there were some things I found in the records where I was like, oh, wait, this wouldn't have flown, this wouldn't have flown in the 19th century either. I'll get to that later. Right? So those are some of the things that I had to correct. And then once we're on the same page, we can start talking about why these binary framings of either or, right? They need to be dismantled, right? I came from an African-American studies background for my master's degree from Clark Atlanta University. And we were taught about the both and, right? Framing rather than either or. Things are a lot more nuanced and complicated. So it moved me to, a leading critical question. I always tell my students, say, what's the critical question? 
And I knew it would become really important as people started to become interested in this topic, right? They were talking about Sims as if he was exceptional. And here I had to go to, once again, the people who were defending him and those who were being really critical and say, y'all, he, he wasn't exceptional at all. He was exceptional in one way. Right? He knew how to, forgive my use of 21st century language, to brand himself. That man knew how to brand himself. Oh, I developed the speculum. Now it's the Sims speculum. You're using a lithotomy position. Now it's the Sims position. He was, you know, he, he was a prolific medical writer. So he knew how to brand himself and market himself. But in terms of his, his ideas, he was in his practices. I'm saying he was like anybody else in the 19th century. Right? And these are the reasons why. Right? I literally, in chapter one, I want to present an intellectual genealogy of those who came before them. Because I've heard all kinds of things. Sims, and he created the idea that Black people don't experience pain. I'm like, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. I can give you readings from the 18th century that state that. And it also does something in history. It builds up someone as a historical boogeyman. We're supposed to be interested in structures and systems. You dump it all on Sims, then, then you lose sight of the real thing. Right? That's why I wasn't necessarily interested in answering the statue question, because I knew, at least for me, Deirdre Cooper Owens was interested in something else that was related to structure and system. And so what I needed to do was to show how these ideas, these ideologies or set of beliefs had already been floating, right? embraced, created and tweaked. And so I start with Georges Cuvier. He was arguably the Western world's most famous natural historian and scientist. And you know, most people who study slavery would be interested in Cuvier because of his treatment of Sarkey Bartman, derisively known as the hot and tot Venus. She was a, a South African born woman um, of, of the Khoi people who uh, later became known for uh, the exploitation of her body right, by the English and the French, largely because she had a big butt. That was it, the size of her buttocks. She was sold from her owner in South Africa to his brother and an English, uh, his English business partner, taken to pick Piccadilly Square and made to dance, you know, in kind of semi-nude or in flesh-colored clothing. She even, you know, white women were so taken with her body, they created a fashion statement called the bustle dress after her body. And I was like, okay, most people wrote about that. What interests me as a historian of slavery and medicine was not the spectacle. How did Cuvier write about her as a researcher? How was he creating a template for how others across the Atlantic world would write about and examine Black women? That's what really interested me. So by the time Sarty Bartman is in her early 20s, she dies at the age of 25. She doesn't live a, a long life at all. She is in Cuvier's care in the menagerie of the National Paris Museum. That's where you keep animals and plants. That's where she's held. In fact, she was bought by an animal trainer. So Cuvier comes in and he's wondering, and he's very explicit. Does she represent, does a Hottentot represent the missing link between primates and human beings? And he wants to know, does she have the Hottentot hood, meaning an elongated labia? Even the size of her buttocks, were pathologized, steatopegia. And I, I mean, I literally say this in just in seriousness. I mean, I'm a Gullah Geechee woman from South Carolina. I guess I had steatopegia like all of my other <laughs> female family members too, right? I mean, these kinds of things. So I'm saying, my goodness. So after she dies, Cuvier can now go in there and perform this autopsy in the name of science on her cadaver. And guess what he finds? She's a regular human being. But he cleans that skeleton, it's on display at the National Museum of Paris. He cuts out her brain, preserves it, puts it in a bell jar, it's on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on display at the National Museum of Paris. He cuts out her genitalia, preserves it, puts it in a bell jar, it's on display until 1974. She dies in the early part of the 19th century. It took until the 21st century. Oh, they lose the brain and the genitalia, by the way. It takes the 21st century before 
the National Museum of Paris sends her skeletal remains back to South Africa so that she can actually have a proper burial. But it lays a template in terms of the medical research and writing and examinations done on Black women in the Atlantic world. We move on to Ephraim McDowell, another father of the ovariotomy. He comes to, to our attention because of his pioneering work on the removal of ovarian tumors. He first experiments, uh, and it was an experiment, but he first operates on a white woman who uh, had been suffering with a tumor and he removes a, a ovarian tumor that's over 20 pounds. She survives. This is the thing that's really important. It's the first surgical incision in the, in the abdomen area where the patient lives. So one would think, uh-oh, the United States is still a fledgling nation, is going to be put on the global medical map. But he doesn't publish. He goes out in Danbury, Kentucky, and he finds four or five more cases so that he can perfect the surgical technique. They're all negresses, as they were called back then. All of them were enslaved but one. Now, I have to say, I'm married to, I call, you know, I call my husband an afro -Lachian. He's originally from West Virginia. There are not a lot of Black people in Appalachia now, and there were not a lot then. Danbury, Kentucky had a Black population of 4%. So I'm like, where in the world did this man find these Black women who were suffering from ovarian tumors? But find them, he did. And he experiments, and you know, according to his, his research, they're all cured except for the one woman who died. We don't know their names. He publishes an article in 1817, and he's, you know, he's pretty excited. Okay, you know, I've done a thing. And he's derided, internationally made fun of. One of the letters of critique was published in the Lancet by a British uh, physician, a Dr. Johnson, who says, well, of course, these patients would have uh, survived. Negresses bear uh, pain and cutting with the impunity of dogs and rabbits. As we know, animals that are thought to reproduce fast, quickly. Once again, this was 1817 when this article was published. Did Sims actually create the idea that black people don't experience pain. No, he, he inherited it. John Peter Matar. He does pioneering experimental work in the same surgery, uh, surgeries that Sims you know, puts to the forefront. And he is another slave owning physician. Notice I'm making these connections because people always thought, no offense to, to you Northerners, I'm a South Carolina girl. And then I grew up in DC, which is just up South. Right? It's not really the North. But everybody thinks that technological advancements happen in the North. And I was like, are we forgetting about all of the advancements made in medicine in the South? From anesthesia, I mean, anesthesia to gynecology, obstetrics, it was happening in the South, largely because of their access to enslaved bodies, almost 4 million of them. So that doesn't mean the obstetrics and gynecology would not have existed, of course, but you have easier access to make these developments when you have a massive population of people who are not owned. So John Peter Matara, who's also an institution builder, he's the founder of the Randolph-Macon College of Medicine, no longer in existence, but he, has a black patient and a white patient. Obviously, this is Virginia, the black patient is enslaved. And they're both suffering from a vesicle vaginal fistula, as it was called then. Today, you would say obstetrical fistula. So, you know, a condition that comes from prolonged childbirth, and there are tears that happen in the vaginal area in the anus, the end result is incontinence. If you are enslaved, this is the thing, and this is really important. The condition of slavery comes through the mother to the child. It's called partus sequitur ventrum. The colonial legislators realized that slavery was so lucrative in the 1600s that they changed the law. Because all before, children inherited the condition of the father. But for enslaved women, women the father could be Thomas Jefferson, you can be a free black man, an enslaved black man, a native man. Didn't matter who the father was. 
because the mother was now the legal instrument that perpetuated the system of slavery. And this is where McDowell's surgical advancement comes into play. This is the only time I promise that I'm going to like make a point about dates, because you know people always think historians are all about dates. But this date is important. The US Constitution bans the transatlantic slave trade in 1807. It's in the Constitution. They never use the word slavery, but we know what they're talking about. You can no longer bring ships in from the, you know, the Caribbean or, or uh, Africa. So in 1808, the country has to figure out, wait, we can't have these imported Africans coming to the country. What are we going to do? We now are concerned with natural increase. That's what it was called. And so those who have a vested interest, interest excuse me, in the maintenance of slavery, because it is making the United States really rich, their focus is now on how do we create natural increase for Black women. This is why those dates in this particular case are so important. So Matar, he does experimental surgery on the enslaved woman and the white woman, and then he finds out that the the enslaved woman isn't healing like how he thought she would because he performed silk suture surgery on the white woman and she, she heals, she's out of there. Matara writes, because he publishes on this, he says for eight clinical trials, his language, not mine, he tried and tried and tried uh, you know, using different methods and this enslaved woman just wouldn't heal. And so he writes in the article, the patient could have been healed had she stopped engaging in sexual intercourse. He didn't use 19th century euphemistic language. He was frustrated. But for me, I was like, yes, finally. There's not that 19th century florid language like he says what it says, to quote the great Negro philosopher, Nini Leet. Um, <laughs> Real housewife joke, or Atlanta housewife, whatever that is, you know, Google it, Google it, y'all. So anyway, right, he said what he said in that article. And for me, I was like, thank you for saying it. Because he knew he was a slave owner. He was smart. He knew black women didn't own their bodies or control, the, they couldn't control who they were having sex with. Not under slavery, you couldn't. And what we don't know, was it her husband? If she were married? Was it some man on the, on the slave farm or plantation that she cared about? Was it him? Was it another owner? We don't know, but what we do know is, and I'm gonna use 21st century language here, slavery becomes the negative social determinant for this ne negative medical outcome. Just like when Cartwright was writing about the less and long capacity along with Benjamin Rush and Thomas Jefferson, they never thought these people who are living in cabins that don't have insulation, smoky fireplaces, it's cold, it's sometimes too hot, they don't have diverse meals. Maybe those are the things that affect their ability to breathe properly and well. And then this is a really interesting one. Nobody ever mentions him. I'm, I'm really thinking about writing an article on this guy, but there's, there are not a lot of records. Francois-Marie Provoche, the father of the C-section, and this is why it's so important for me to talk about this structurally because he was born in France, gets his medical degree, he goes off to Haiti, then France's most profitable colony, and he sets up shop. And he begins experimenting on enslaved Haitian women, trying to perfect the C-section. He gets wind that there might be revolution, and there was, as we know, by 1804. But in seven, uh, by 1800, he skedaddles, he goes to Donaldsonville, Louisiana, right outside of Baton Rouge, another former French colony right, before it became a state. And guess what he does in the 1830s? He begins experimental surgeries on enslaved women trying to perfect the C-section. He's in fact cited as the second American man to have, two uh, to have two successful cesarean sections. This is a really interesting thing. History is not always linear, but historical practices are. Historical practices can be real linear. And by that, what do I mean? If you look at the stats from Mississippi, from slavery to freedom, I'm not Mississippi, excuse me, Louisiana. I, I worked at Ole Miss for five years. 
y'all. <laughs> Just Google old myths. That's all I got to say. So sometimes I get flashbacks when I talk about these kinds of things. Anyway, I, you know, I, I looked at the stats from Slavery to Freedom for Louisiana. Louisiana had used Black women's bodies for C-sections more so than any other state in the union. They were number one in the disproportionate use of Black women and birthing people's bodies for C-sections. They were only knocked down to number two just recently. And when I say recently, like within a five-year period by Mississippi, the state that has the blackest population to this day. So that's why I'm much more interested in, because if we just implicate Sims, we lose sight of the structural issues that we have to confront. And if people really want to know, oh, wait, are you playing the race card? No, I'm not. I can show you, and trust me, I have a lot of footnotes, a lot of citations. These men were not shy. I mean, when they were talking about these folks, they were transparent. So I'm like, I don't have to make this up. You can just go to the autobiographies, to the medical journal articles, to the textbooks, you'll see. So this is why, and this is, you know, the, the person who most people are interested in, where I always have to push back gently, and I'm like, this book is not about them. That's why I start chapter one about the varied medical experiences of these practitioners. And, and you know, most of the book is devoted to enslaved women and then Irish immigrant women, because Sims also performed these kinds of experiments on Irish immigrant women when he moved to New York. But he learned the exploitative practices on the bodies of enslaved women in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, that brings us to the point when I was in grad school and I started my research on this in 2005, I started to go to the archives in 2006 and seven, right? I graduated in 08. And so when I started this process and I would go to these special collections, to these archives, folk would say to me, why don't you study the Civil War? You'll find out more about surgical developments. You know, one person in particular said, I, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, but I think you'll have enough to maybe publish a pamphlet. Because they, they were like, there are no sources. Well, you know what? You are right. If we're looking at sources from enslaved people, they were not allowed to read and write. It was illegal. So they're not going to leave sources. But guess what I can do? I can extract information from the folk who owned them and treated them. And the wonderful thing about the history of slavery that some folk have tried to critique is that there's some speculative creativity that we have. So we may not be able to have all the answers, but we can ask some really good questions. So what that means is I was confronted with this other legacy that black folk and slavery had nothing to do with these advances. So even when Sims was writing about the Negro servitors, once again, his words, not mine, the illustrations were of a white nurse, a white patient. But this is where, right? Sims was, was clear, it was happening in Montgomery. He moved from a small slave farm in Mount Meg, goes to Montgomery, Alabama. As he writes, I had a little hospital built for myself. And I was like, no, you didn't. You had your enslaved laborers build a hospital. But nevertheless, he has it built for himself where he conducts these experiments. And he does so, unlike this picture where the patient is clothed, has on shoes. In fact, his hand is just resting at her upper side. The nurse is actually inserting the speculum. In reality, he has public viewings for people in Montgomery to come and view these surgeries, because they were exceedingly rare for the 19th century. Most people are not getting surgery. So he would invite townsfolk, you know, kind of the muckety mucks, and the patients would be naked, and he would perform those surgeries. After about two, two and a half years of failed experimental surgeries, his two white medical assistants, they quit. They were like, this is, I mean, this is a fool's errand. You keep failing. So Sims trains his patients to act as his nurses and surgical assistants. Now, let me tell you where the racial cognitive dissonance, as I call it, as I call it, comes in. Women were supposed to think with their uteri and not their brain. 
people of African descent were to, they were supposedly, you know, living in a state of intellectual arrested development. And yet, STEM teaches black women who were illiterate the very same things he taught white male surgical assistants who had been formally educated. Now, this is a real interesting thing about slavery. You can write down the Negro is insensible. Women are hysterical. But look at what the record says about the practice. So when Tom was saying, you know, she, she's looking at it a little differently, I had to take out a phrase, might not even be a full sentence. But sends my right, Lucy lost sense of herself. She struggled violently. Wait a minute now, black people don't experience pain, so why are you restraining them? You shouldn't have to restrain people who don't experience pain, but you do. Oh, these foolish Negroes, they're like children. But wait, they're like children that you train to help you. And I often joke, but I say this, you know, tongue in cheek. That surgical team was the one that helped him actually get the reparative technique right. And they couldn't even read and write. So what does that say, right? He knows that even though they're considered movable property, slave owners knew that enslaved people were smart because you're not gonna continue a slave trade for hundreds of years to get people who are not. And they know that they're skilled. If they were so ignorant and dumb, they were, after about five years, you're like, uh -uh, I'm losing money on these folks. But you maintain it for almost 400 years. So clearly we know that although the ideology and the writing state one thing, look at the practices. They're almost always oppositional to what is written on the page if you're looking at it from the perspective of those who, who you claim to center. So where does that leave us, right? Back to where I started from. I really wanted to have, and, and lots of folks, especially when I was in school, we were discouraged because we were told, you're not being objective if you put the past and the present in conversation. Once again, I went to two HBCUs. The past were always in, you know, it was always in conversation with the present. I, I mean, I, I could only hope. I was like, well, if there's you know, 25 people buy my book, then maybe somebody will use it to show that there's this systemic problem around, and this is before we were using the term birthing people. So we would say, you know, with black women and children. Now we say black maternal or birthing crisis. But I was hopeful. And who knew in 2017, right, that this thing, that I was writing about and interested in about people who had died long, 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 long ago would still resonate. The, some, the numbers would still be the same. And so there is something else that's interesting. People were more invested, not because they cared, not because they were more compassionate, but people were much more interested in black women's reproductive care because they were interested in the price tag on the heads of the children that these women produced for the continuation of slavery. Slavery ends, all of a sudden, the very women that you would give blankets to because they had twins and produced a number of children, now they are irresponsible, they're promiscuous, they're baby mamas, they're welfare queens. And in fact, in the 1980s, there was a this, I mean, my students are often amazed. You all should read it, seriously, if you haven't already. The, the myth of the crack baby. You can see the footage, right? I was a teenager in the 80s, but I remember reading the footage and we were like, oh my gosh. They were like, this will topple the US economy. I have my students go back. I said, you know, you can, you can argue with Dr. Cooper Owens' interpretation. You're allowed to do that. In fact, I want you to, but look at the source. 1985, Ira Chestnut, physician. He and his research team write a four-page article in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm more shocked that he got a four-page article in there because I know, let me try and submit a four-page article. They would be like, lady, what? So I'm shocked that a four-page article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but it was about cocaine use in pregnant women. In that first article, he doesn't mention race, but a mainstream journalist caught wind of the survey I mean, excuse me, of the article. And it was a small group, only 20 something women. We later learned it was multiracial, but because people had, just like those UVA medical residents, they had a belief 
in the pathology of black people, instead of looking at cocaine use in a multiracial group of pregnant women, all of a sudden black women were producing crack babies. And then we later find out, 25 plus years later, that most of the purchases for crack cocaine were not done by black people. Stanley Nelson has done, he's a, a wonderful filmmaker. He's done a, a lot of work. I mean, there's a lot of studies now. And Howard Ch Chesnoff even had to say, I'm sorry, I, I may have misspoken and overblown what I, was, what I was advocating before. So this whole mythology, people are much more interested in anti-Black narratives. I mean, which is incredible, incredible to me. He doesn't mention race, and yet we assign race to the pathological Black mother. And so what it has wrought is this legacy of medical racism where we are now seeing, right, I think especially in terms of a post, I'm hopeful, a COVID-19 moment, if you're going to say post, but a COVID-19 moment where everybody's talking about health disparities. What we're now seeing is, right, the maternal birthing crisis in, in stark figures, three to four times more likely to suffer from pregnancy complications, infant mortality, morbidity. I'm not even gonna go through the stats, you know it. And trust me, the numbers don't change. I give talks a, a lot of places. I mean, 30 minutes before here, I was giving a Zoom talk to the National Library of Medicine and NIH. DC stats, the same. University of Kentucky, the same. I gave a talk at McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh, the same. I mean, I could go on and on. Even in Lincoln, Nebraska, Omaha, Lincoln has a four to six percent black population, the same. So all I have to do is just kind of plug in the city. And I can tell you, oh, maybe the ancestors are telling me wrap it up in with something joyful. I will, I promise. So the wonderful thing that's happening now, we have folk who are doing research where they're like, wait, 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 y'all, let's not race. I promise it's not race that's creating this because we know race is a social construct. But what it is is anti-black racism. So Rachel Hardiman, a public health uh, scholar who is at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, this is where I end with the big stat. She and her research, research team, they combed through almost 2 million records in Florida. This is in fact published um, in January last year. And they find that when patients have providers who look like them, the mortality rates are cut by 50%. So it is encouraging for me to hear, right, when, when Steve and I uh, and his, his uh, wife were going to Hutch's last night, and he's like, you know, we are really trying to create these pipeline systems because that, that, that deals with the structure. He was like, yeah, we, we're doing college, we're doing the med school, high school, but we're trying to start a program where we're adopting an elementary school. So they're, they're trying to do these kinds of things. You all are trying to do those kinds of things, right? And Rachel Hardiman shows this. And literally study after study after study has shown it is not race, it is in fact racism that is the big indicator of a negative maternal outcome. So with that, I'll end with saying if we can just move from looking at these historical figures, but also the flesh and blood folk before us as curious objects of historical and scientific uh, inquiry, right, the kind of objectification of them and move them into subjectivity where we demand that they receive the quality care that they need, that we diversify medical curricula so that they have books like this, not so St. Shameless Plug, you can buy it at the end of this talk out there, um, but you have these kinds of books and there are lots of books written like this that are really good, right? What we can do is create the kind of nation where the U.S. is not the most dangerous place in the high income earning world for black women and birthing people to get pregnant and to give birth, but in fact, that it can be a haven for black women and birthing people and their children. So I thank you. I welcome um, your comments and your questions as we move to panel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so, so very much. I don't, I, there's not too much more to add to that. Uh, I just want to say that there is a kind of thinking 
uh, that is so powerful and that it affects a shift in your perspective, a shift in your consciousness that feels almost physical, page by page, sentence by sentence. And that is something that we all felt when we read Medical Bondage. And it, it I'll speak in the first person, it put me face to face with the delusions that I have been living with, the delusions that I had been uh, tolerating. So thank you for, for coming. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for joining our panel. Uh, I'd like to invite our panelists to the stage uh, for this is Buffalo's finest. These are people who are doing the work that you were mentioning in the end. Rita Hubbard Robinson, New Water and Associate CEO, Vanessa Barnaby, Professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Beth Harvey, incredible PGY4 surgical resident, uh, Maya Adabibi, medical student who impress, inspires and impresses me every day, and uh, India Walton, a nurse, community organizer, and a hero to millions, including myself. Rita, would you? Perfect. Testing, you. testing. Hello, everyone. I'm just really glad to be here today. And I also would like to uh, thank the UB School of Medicine, Jacob School of Medicine, and Dr. Schweitzberg, and the Department of Surgery uh, for allowing us to be part of this uh, important conversation uh, with our esteemed guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Cooper Owens. Her presentation was just extraordinary and her book is also uh, another plug for the book. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Owens, um, I uh, was intrigued by the discussion of race and class in your book, as well as your personal story and the illumination of the status of Black women having the worst maternal health outcomes in the United States. Further, the current medical insensitivity and the malpractice of physicians in the treatment of Black female patients show that the vestiges of slavery and the practice of race-based health in modern medicine is still pervasive and tied the sins of the past to the current practice of medicine. I would like to offer three points that I believe further illuminate the issue of race and class in the present day experience. In my recent work in teenage pregnancy prevention, a reference to the hypersexuality of black girls was expressed by a renowned local leader and an expert in adolescent medicine. The doctor made the reference that I give them all larks, which are long acting reproductive uh, uh, com um, contraceptive, contra contraceptive uh, to keep them from having babies. I wanna say that again. I'd give them all larks to keep them from having babies. The second reference I'd like to make is social and political references made concerning the former First Lady Michelle Obama and uh, uh, her references of her being an ape in, we in heels and having a relationship with a gorilla and not being a woman permeated her persona during her husband's presidency. And she, who herself a black woman struggled with infertility and miscarriages before conceiving her two beautiful daughters. Beyonce and Serena Williams both survived the potenti potenti excuse me, uh, both survived potentially fatal pregnancy complications, not being heard, believed, or regarded by their medical team, even when they are wealthy, relatively healthy, and otherwise wise enough to amass fortune and success. We know that all Black women are 243% more likely than white women to die of pregnancy or childbirth related causes. So my question is this, can you discuss the current maternal health data in the context of social, political, and medical realities and what medical education's role is in repairing and correcting the practice of gynecology and the medical care of Black women? Thank you so much. Is this, I'm not sure, is this on? Okay, great. Um, thank you. I mean, I think to the first part of your question, you answered it. You laid it out. <laughs> like, are you a historian as <laughs> well? Because you've laid out the context um, for us. You know, there, there are some stats um, 
Black women are the only women in this country with, with regard to these complications around pregnancy and childbirth where class, education, relationship status doesn't matter. So, you know, it, it's, this brings us to these, these issues um, that we spoke about, you know, the kind of anti-Black racism uh, that these patients are facing, the classism that they're facing. Um, and people start to pay attention when you have folk like Beyonce, <clears throat> excuse me, or Serena Williams telling their stories because they're like, my goodness, these women are multimillionaires. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they work out all the time through dance or through sports, and yet they're still being treated in a way that is comparable to uh, the ways in which these young girls were described by this, this leader. Um, so that's number one. You, for Black women, our status, our income doesn't protect us. And so I think what needs to happen is that we should, and you'll probably hear me say this more and more, we should listen to our patients. Um, India, India Walton talked about her second pregnancy and she was 19 and she's like, I was young, but I knew my body that something didn't feel right and being dismissed. I don't have children, but I, at, the, at uh, the ending of my book, I talk about my IVF experiences. And um, finally, before I found uh, a third infertility specialist uh, who was much more gracious and democratic in their treatment of me, I remember constantly being asked whether I was married. And I'm like, how many single people have the last name Cooper Owens? And it's not fancy, but I do have a wedding ring on the right finger, on the right hand, right? I mean, you know, and I mean the right hand, like for, for traditionally how we do this. So, I, you know, I was just amazed. And finally I said, you know, women can get pregnant without having a husband, right? I mean, it was just this, this idea or being, uh, having my cervix dilated twice without anesthesia for 15 minutes. And, you know, that's painful. You feel somebody holding your cervix in their hands and they take a long dial or a washer with a metal brush and they bore a hole into you and then act surprised when you scream. And then being left, this is in, in Manhattan, the Upper East Side, by the way. And then being left to clean myself up after 15 minutes and then walk across the street to the hospital to get a HSG. But my body was so inflamed that it couldn't happen that day. And then he does it again for the next visit without telling me. I have a PhD, I'm married, kind of firmly in the middle class, not wealthy, not poor, and none of that protected me. So those are the, the kinds of things. Listen to your patient. I mean, that's number one. And then treat your patient with respect and concern. It's, I don't know how to ask people to change their hearts because I always go back to that UVA study. Those students know better in terms of the data, and yet they still chose anti-Blackness. So I don't know how to tell people to change their hearts. And I also don't know how to tell parents to stop raising children who are anti-Black. Because as much as you say you're not, those statistics are showing that children think Black people have tails. So I, you know, I, I don't know other than listening and being respectful. Dr. Barnaby. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my question around a little bit, Deirdre. Okay, uh, because you kind of answered some of the uh, questions I was gonna pose, and um, I have been a co-chair of the New York State Maternal Mortality Review Board for the last three years, and it's been um, eye-opening, um, depressing. Um, I'm usually <laughs> crying by the end of the meetings that last, you know, hours and hours. And um, we're struggling with how to assess the care that's being provided for discrimination and, and racism. And we're, we're really having a hard time and, and this is a national uh, effort, um, and it's only been in the last three years that New York has really undertaken this, this task. Um, how do we, how do we get to that, to that point where we're able to discern? It's really challenging, I think, for all of us in medicine to, 
read a medical chart and, and try to figure out if the patient has been subject to racism. And it's taken us a long time, as you mentioned, to understand that it's not just socioeconomic status that has been determining those poor birth and maternal outcomes. So maybe you can give us some insight into how we can dissect that better as uh, physicians to get to that. Maybe, maybe we need that historical eye that, that, uh, that we, don't, we don't have. Um, Thank you. I would say just assume they have. <laughs> assume every Black person that you meet has experienced some anti-Blackness at some point. So whether it is overt, whether it is implicit, um, just assume they have. You know, I, I use this example. I was uh, attending a, a conference at Harvard Business School and it was on the census. And so I'm writing about Harriet Tubman and her disability and I'm really interested in the census. How does someone just, how, how do we use kind of hap the haptic, right? Our, our, our intellectual sense of, of being, right? Through our five senses, how do we use that? So I'm, I'm there kind of observing. Academics have something called academia.edu. So anytime somebody Googles you, it pops up, right? You don't know the person, but it'll say it was Cambridge, <laughs> Cambridge, 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 because I was the only black person there besides the, the food staff. I promise you, I'm telling the story, but I'm gonna get to your question. So anyway, I'm Southern, that's what we do. We talk in parables. So, I, you know, so this, this guy comes up and he's talking about wines and everybody, you know, I remember I said, how do you write an ad for wine in the medieval period? without people being able to, to taste it or smell it. So we're talking about these senses and a woman, I mean, sharply dressed, very wealthy. She works for the Harvard Business School and she, you know, she's blonde and thin and all of these things. So she says, you know, it's just like with uh, the research data that we have that shows that African-Americans um, tend to not like complex wines they tend to like sweeter wines. <laughs> and then she says, but in, in terms of the high end spirits, they do like cognac. So they have a more sophisticated <laughs> palate. So I'm sitting here like, wait a minute now, I grew up in the South and we'll use 23 spices to fry chicken. And yet our tongues can't taste the nuances of wine. And so I had to tell them, right? <laughs> Just because I might, I might go into a, a corner store, but that's when I lived in Bedside. So there were wine stores and then we had liquor stores. So the liquor store sold like peach Moscato, raspberry Moscato, right? Because the assumption was, oh, you know, these people don't have sophisticated taste. But the wine store was actually owned by a black man, the one that you buzz folk in, but he just hired white, his, white hipsters. Right, so I'm trying to say, wait, black people can detect all the flavors in this in the, in the food, and in fact, they cook for white people during slavery and after, and yet our tongues somehow stop working when it comes to wine. So once again, it was this this for me trying to explain. No, this is a, about projection. Just assume that black people have experienced it. That's where I would go from. Not like, can you dissect it? No, it's happened. It's not always about calling somebody an epithet but it's about the ways that there could exist a liquor store and a wine store who sell totally different products. That there are black people who live closer to, um, you know, chemical plants or interstates. So once again, it's about that environment that it has happened, right? Not that did it, no, it's happened, it's happened. So that's where I would, I would start with. Thank you so much. Maya Adabiyan. Hi, Dr. Cooper Owens. Hello. Happy Black History Month. Thank you. Yes. She offered me Nigerian food. <laughs> <laughs> so for my question, um, in 2020, a resolution was formalized here at the Jacobs School of Medicine, and it was formalized by various student-led organizations. It was designed to acknowledge and respond to the race-based violence against Black people nationally. Given the insights you provided in your book and the knowledge that you blessed us here today, how can we as medical students tuning in and sitting here in the crowd in this day and age leverage our positionality 
to work towards the abolishment of race-based medicine and the establishment of identity inclusive care. Yeah, I think the, the last part of what you, you said, the establishment of identity inclusive clinical care that is about treating the patient holistically. I mean, that's, that's a part of it, right? Um, the mm -hmm. other is, once again, I'm a real advocate because I am a professor on uh, diversifying medical curricula, um, integrating books that speak to this from everybody who's interested in the same things, right? So I don't handle bodies, um, but you know, I am about how do I produce knowledge that can help someone who is helping these patients? Um, so I think creating that kind of curricula, and I mean, I always go back to listening to patients. The thing is, Black folk, and I promise, I'm not speaking as a delegate of the Black folks, I promise you that, but Black people, um, they don't want you to come up with some, you know, magic trick. They're simply saying, if other populations aren't dying and suffering these complications, can you just apply that to us? Like, you don't have to use special tools or anything. We just want you, if white women and Asian and Asian American women have higher rates or, or whomever, right? Fill in the blank. We just want to live. We just want to have the same quality of care. We want to thrive. So we're not saying use a special instrument. What we're saying is you prove that you can save other people's lives who don't look like us. Thus, can you just do that? And that's a pretty easy ask for something that's hard. Now, the other structural issues get into what we've all talked about, the environmental issues, you know, access, equity. I mean, those are, those are the structural issues at play. But in terms of the actual practice and treatment, you, you don't have to do much that's different. Thank you. India Walton. Um, thank you again, Deidre, for being here. It's, it's always nice to hear an academic confirm the experiences that I've, I've had, so I appreciate that. I think the most um, interesting part of the presentation for me was the last statistic about improving Black maternal health um, when there are Black care providers, right? And while we're waiting for this pipeline to be established and successful, um, what are some of the things that you believe can be done in the meantime to make sure that there are Black providers, whether that is paraprofessionals or support staff or community health workers? Like, how do you see us filling in the gap um, while we wait for more um, medical providers of color to be onboarded? Yeah, no, that's a really important question. Um, <clears throat> a, this is something that sometimes when I'm consulting with hospital systems. And I'm like, well, how many people on your board are from the community? Like the actual patients that you treat. And, and typically they're not. And I don't mean the folk with like degrees and those kinds of things, but I'm talking about the actual community members, you know, who are experiencing these, these maltreatments, um, who might've lost babies, who, you know, who have complications that are longstanding, they need to be there. You know, board members are almost always folk who, you know, you can read off, like, I mean, even my bio, I'm like, sometimes, like, don't put me on the board. I got enough to do. Y'all heard how many jobs I have, right? I got a lot of jobs. So get somebody else from the community. I think that's, that's important, number one. And then you can create, um, when I was at McGee Women's Hospital, for their diversity summit, it was so inspiring to see that they have members of the community on, and I'm talking about decision-making boards, right? Not just boards of, to raise money, but they had women who were in the community. They had a long-standing relationship with someone from the school system who was very familiar with students who were under undergoing some challenges or having some fragility in their lives. And they reached out to those students and you know, it could help them medically, could help the parents, you know, so it was really encouraging to see. I also think that for areas that have them, doulas and midwives, there should be a synergistic relationship with doctors, with hospitals, with doulas and midwives. I know that there are programs in um, the five boroughs in New York and also Northern California. Um, so there, there are a number of ways that you can address some of these things more immediately. Um, but it, it takes, I think, really listening to what are the individual needs of, say, an Erie County community versus a Lincoln, Nebraska community. Lancaster community is going to have a very different set of 
issues than Erie County. Um, so extracting that brain power, I mean, I literally, they can tell you, I kept referring to you as Mayor, Mayor Walton <laughs> and all of my emails and they were like, Deirdre, sadly, she is not. But I'm like someone who comes from the ground, who has this medical experience, who also has organizing experience. I mean, there are so many other people like India that you, she's not the only one, right? But ask her to give you their names. You know, she can, I'm sure she can give you some names of folks and have those, have those people in the room with you and come up with some solutions. Thank you so much. Bethany Harvey. Thank you, Dr. Cooper Owen for speaking with us today. And I just had one final question. Um, in your book, you so point, poignantly describe the appalling atrocities that were acted upon the women of color, which ultimately led us to some advancements in gynecologic surgeries. And so how do we properly honor them as a medical community and honor their stories without the focus being on the trauma necessarily, but rather their strength and on the patient's burden that they bear through that? Yeah, that was a really good one. In, in fact, I have to be honest, um, your question was probably the one I mulled over the most because I, I had all of these conflicting thoughts. Um, as a historian of slavery, the trauma is always just gonna be there. And so I'm like, do I excise that? Because we need to emotionally feel better about it. Um, or do I tell, tell the story as best I can? And how do I privilege people's dignity and humanity? And so that's the thing. I, I didn't give these people humanity and dignity. They already had it, right? Um, I'm just a vessel for being able to, to transfer that to the page um, as best I could. And I know it's still, it's still lacking because um, it's, it's interesting. What I found in this country, and I say this as a historian um, who studied race and racism for almost two decades, oftentimes, oftentimes people are not, you know, let me be specific with my language, white people, are not comfortable with assisting Black people unless they hear the oppression narrative. So they want to hear, oh, Shaquan grew up in the projects dodging bullets. He had to go to sleep with his stomach growling at night. And yet Shaquan is now the head of neurosurgery. I mean, even in terms of, like, you young people are too young for this. The older Black folk, no. Remember Calvin from McDonald's? That, that commercial, they used to get on my nerves because it was like, Calvin is out here, you know, not getting into trouble like the other boys on the block, but he's going to McDonald's and now he's going to make it. You know, those like, that's the way that people are trained to help black people advance. And so how do we then get real talk? White people, how do we get them to divorce that? You should just help me because the stats say that you should and also that you're decent. Whether I grew up in the, in, in the projects or a mansion, you should want to help me if you know that this birthing crisis affects me and you know, the, the woman who grew up in the projects in the same way, because it does. That's what the stats are showing. Now, that doesn't mean to diminish someone's story, but I, I want folk to to recognize that the dignity and the humanity is there. Um, and I don't necessarily wanna divorce the trauma of slave, slavery because it was brutal. But I also want to highlight the ways that people built community. Um, when you're giving a talk that is about the birthing crisis, you know, a, a large part of it is to show some of the continuities, but there are places in my book where I'm able to show how these black folk loved on each other and cared for each other and created space and community for each other in, in ways that sometimes made me stop, you know, cause I was just like, wow, you know, in the face of all of this, here they were creating a loving space of healing and nurturing and providing words that built each other up in moments where you're sick, which is when you're most vulnerable and, and fragile. And so, you know, oftentimes the, these kinds of talks don't allow me to do that. 
But I do think that there is a way that we can provide balance. And so that's why I really mulled over your question because it, it was a good one, but it also made me think about the kinds of language um, that I needed to use today to get folk to recognize that um, helping in advancing Black people's causes, um, helping to advance, and notice I'm saying helping, not lead, helping to advance Black people's um, desires for better quality of care don't necessarily have to be attendant with the trauma. And that's not on us. That's on white folk. Before we bring it to a close, I would love to get uh, a voice or two from the medical students here. I wonder if, uh, Adi Tayo, if you would ask a question. Hello, my name is Adi Tayo. I'm a third year medical student and I'm currently on surgery. So thank you so much for this incredible lecture. Um, and I just wanna say uh, your context and your nuance is so well appreciated, truly. Um, I actually was primary author on the resolution that Maya mentioned. Um, a couple uh, years ago, and she was there throughout everything, through every phone call for about two weeks. Uh, that was how we started our, uh, that's how a lot of the black and brown students started their first summer after med school. Um, so I suppose I have my scripted question and I have my question that formed naturally after this amazing talk, which I'll start with the latter. Um, in the midst of all this work, we're seeing so much history of dehumanization of people who you stated yourself are and were human. How do you continue to do this work? And how do you continue to face your colleagues in the midst of this without kind of holding some level of, I don't wanna say resentment, but just ill, Ill, Ill feelings, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and my second question is at our level at, as medical students, where we don't hold as much power and we also don't hold as much literally medical knowledge yet, what can we do to advocate for our patients in these spaces? Thank oh, you. You've done it. I mean, you, <laughs> you're the primary author of this resolution. I mean, you, you've done it. Um, you know, I'm. That's that's a lot. You know, that's a lot in the midst of of training and learning. Um, so you just keep doing that kind of work and also share it so that others have a model and a template from which they can borrow um, and build as well. I think the the first one. It's interesting. My husband. Um, always says to me, I don't think he's read my book. He's read parts of it, but he, it was hard for him. He's a um, black man I met at Clark Atlanta. So on paper, he's black, but he looks as white as snow. He has a white mama and a black daddy. Sounds like his black daddy looks like his white mama. So <laughs> needless to say, he experiences race in a very different way that I, than I do. And it, it actually dredged up a lot of negative feelings. He, he would ask, how are you not angry? How are you not mad? Um, I, I never emerged angry, I think, because I knew undertaking this, it, there was not going to be a red bow at the end. I mean, I study slavery. Um, however, what I had to do was create a well of joy. So in, in grad school, I lived in Los Angeles. I would go rollerblading. <laughs> I would tell myself, okay, write three pages a day. How do you... How do you then treat yourself? I just went rollerblading. I also have a rule. Um, Jeanette Jones, who's here, she can tell you anytime <laughs> she's she's my colleague at UNL. Anytime people call me or come over, they were like, "What are you watching? Some old seventies or eighties black sitcom?" Because I I have to be surrounded by images of black joy, however silly it is. So in my home, that's what I I do. In my office space, I have beautiful pieces of art by Kahende Wiley and Bisa Butler and um, different representations of Black people doing different things um, that show the diversity of our humanity and our experiences. That's important for me to be able to look at, at beautiful people and things. Um, and so because I know that I'm talking about structures, I don't focus on an individual. Like, oh, that white person. Well, a white woman created my husband. And every night I got to look at his white face. <laughs> I don't care how many African tattoos he has all over his body for his black man starter kit, as I call it. But every day I got to contend with that. So 
right? Once again, it's the institution. That's, it's, the, it's the institutional and the structural thing. Because Toni Morrison said, right, and I'm paraphrasing here, that we will sometimes let white supremacy take us away from the things that we need to be doing. And so for me, how do I then create, help create new structures? I'm, I'm never gonna be on the street with a bullhorn, but I can help you change your curriculum. I can help consult. I can provide some historical context. You know, I can be a board member. You know, I stay in my lane. That's what I know how to do to help change some of the structures. Um, probably the proudest moment that, and I knew black women had to be behind this, um, a bipartisan committee of Congress contacted me via email. I was, but I thought it was like some person, you know, sometimes I get hate mail, so, you know, and I was like, ah, this is probably some spam or whatever. And so I ignored it for a couple of days and then I went back and I was like, and it's this, in fact, it was a Senator in um, a state Senator in New York. And they are interested in finding out um, how they can get money for COVID-19 recovery around racial health disparities. And they knew that there was this black birthing crisis. So they're like, oh, this is connected to COVID. I'm like, uh-uh, how much, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? I'm gonna try and teach you 400 years in 15 minutes, but it has nothing to do with COVID. This had been, this had been long standing. It turned into a 45 minute conversation. But if that bill is ever passed, no one will ever know Deirdre Cooper Owens had anything to do with that. But the fact that I could be able to provide some, some context, that meant something, right? That I was able to share that knowledge um, so that they could think about health disparities and medical racism in a more nuanced way. So those are the kinds of things that kind of push me along and bring me some joy. Thank you, Mario Carrillo, will you ask our final question? Um, hi, I'm Mario. I'm a second year medical student and thank you for coming here today, Dr. Cooper Owens, and really sharing your insight um, and your expertise. And kind of like Tayo, <laughs> I came with a prepared question, but I think after this um, experience, it's kind of evolved, um, especially with what we've been learning today. And kind of thinking back to that study done at uh, UVA, um, you know, we have classmates who come with a very varied set of historical knowledge, right? That can drive how and inform how we behave and treat our future patients. Um, so when we come with this diversity of experiences where I feel some students, you know, from this talk have, you know, connect to some things to their lived experience versus to some students who feel that this could be some, there, maybe there are some topics today that they learned about for the first time, right? Um, how can medical students with all the learning that we have to do and all the training that we have to do, how can we start a practice of kind of learning about historical context in medicine and really embodying that and having that kind of drive the work that we hope to do in a more equitable way? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. I think, I mean, there are easy ways, right? You can become a member of the Association of American uh, Historians of Medicine which is a, a group that mixes MDs and PhDs who just have an interest in this. Um, one of my dear friends and, um, you know, in a, a, a kind of member with some, some political power because he's the head of uh, the Department of the History of Medicine, Science and Technology at Johns Hopkins. And as you, you know, Johns Hopkins is kind of history of medicine programs is, is top notch. It's where the medical seminar was created uh, in this country. And so he's an MD, PhD. And he's, he's done a lot of work to bring in community members, to bring in PhDs, but also MD, PhDs. So I would say the AAHM is an organization that you can, you can join. They have a student subscription fee um, just to read the materials. You know, there are so many people doing all kinds of things that relate to um, the DEI issues that medical schools have adopted. So I would say something like that. Um, and then just, you know, I have to be honest with you, I, I was giving my talk today for the National Library of Medicine and I used a term and I had to self-correct. I said, oh, you know, we turn a blind eye and I stopped. I said, that is Abel's language. I am so sorry, let me rephrase. So when you hear somebody say something like that, correct them in love, right? Um, use a praxis of love. 
um, but also self-edit and to know how harmful our, our language can be even when we don't intend for it to be, right? And so I had to, to make that correction immediately. So those are, those are some of the things that you can do, but it can be hard because the one thing I know, nobody ever wants to think of themselves as being a practitioner of anti whatever it is. That's really tough. So maybe reading those materials, um, listening, um, being respectful, learning to self-edit language um, and change our ideologies around some of those things, um, you know, starts with, with this. You know, and only you can do, only you can do that. It is with uh, deep gratitude to you, Dr. Cooper Owens, and to this panel and to this audience that I turn it over to Dr. Schweitzberg. Wow. I'm sure many, I'm like all of you, my head is spinning. We continue to, um, to learn. So uh, on behalf of our entire social justice health equity team that meets every other week for the last two years, many thanks to the awesome team. It's a team, can't, like surgery, you can't do it all by yourself. I do want to take just a moment for us to just take a moment to wish well the children and the staff of McKinley High School who were injured yesterday. They were operated on by you know, members of the Department of Surgery in multiple hospitals throughout our system. We wish them well. Uh, the, the violence in our high schools is terrible. And just there, there are members of our community. And so we just want to just take a short moment to just Put them in our prayers and hope for a speedy recovery for all of them from the stabbing and shooting event. Um, also want to thank um, our friends uh, Tony Arena at Stryker, who's been a supporter of many of our social justice and health equity events in Drone STEM and innovation, who have helped support uh, this scholarship. Their continued philanthropic support of our programs is greatly appreciated. The Summer Fellowship for next year's summer research students will be open again. So Mario, talk it up with your, your classmates and, and things like that. We have a number of scholarships that are specifically designed to provide equity and academic support for underrepresented students in medicine to spend some time with us in the Department of Surgery this summer. Special thanks to all of our panelists to India Walton for coming, uh, and to Rita, and to Vanessa Barnaby, to Maya, Beth, of course, to our speaker. So we have a um, special tradition in the Department of Surgery. So there you come on up. I promise you, you do not have one of these. So on behalf of the Department of Surgery, it is my honor to give you our crystal buffalo for all of our named speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you'll we'll keep it and wear it forever. Let us, one last applause for our speaker. So illuminating, so enlightening, so gorgeous. Thank you so much. And with, and with all of that, if you, if, if you do want a copy of her book, and I actually, I have bought more than 20 copies for book club, but I had to buy number 21 because I didn't have one that was signed. So I encourage you to, if you haven't read her book, get a copy of her book or, or later get it online. And so we'll sign your book at the, at the book signing. So Thank you so much, dinner. Good night, everybody. We'll ship this one. Oh, okay.